All right, well, we're in the shop today and we are back to work on rebuilding my little LS Miata here. This thing has been absolutely thrashed for the last six years straight. It's never gotten a real break. It's never really gotten a maintenance level to match the amount of thrashing it gets and it's never complained. It's always been old trusty, old reliable, but this last year really kind of pushed it over the edge. We ended up competing with it for most of the season because we hadn't finished building this car, but because we were so focused on this car, it never got any maintenance or upgrades before the season. We just threw a hundred shot on it to handle the bigger tracks and off we went. And it just kind of all caught up to it at once. So we're in the process of getting this thing rebuilt put back together, upgraded better than ever. We did a health check on the engine and we are low on compression in a couple holes, but I don't think it's low enough to matter for what we're gonna be doing with the car from here on out. So we're just gonna forget all about that <laughs> until it becomes a big enough problem we have to deal with it. So we went ahead and upgraded the cooling system, new radiator, new fan setup, new wiring. We switched to an electric water pump to try to cool this thing down quicker at idle and grid, which is where most of your cooling happens on a drift car. And we've got all that pretty squared away. So before we start on any of the other upgrades, we need to move on to really what started us down this path, and that is the rear end. So the last competition I did, the last time this car drifted, I had a pretty nasty dirt drop, and basically the diff caught the edge of the track. and tweaked the subframe, tweaked the diff mount. It hurt the axle, so then it exploded in the next battle. just kind of made a big mess for us to clean up. And we need to get that done first before we move into any more of the fun stuff. But the goal is to have this thing back together here in the next few days because there is a big event coming up and I wanna take it to the track and have my buddies Raldo and Josue drive it. So they've gone to all the competitions with me. You know, they've seen the car go rounds, they've seen the car battle pro cars and they've seen the car win competitions, uh, but they've never actually had a chance to drive it because it's always been the comp car and it's always just been non-stop going and going and going. And now that it's kind of semi-retired, it's a good opportunity for them to uh, get to see what it feels like from the driver's seat and see what it feels like to drive a drift car this rowdy. So I'm actually very, very excited about this. I can't wait to see what they think of it, but I want to make sure it's in tip top shape before they drive it. So that being said, it's not gonna fix itself. So I need to quit jibber jabbering. We need to get to work. All right, guys, before we get too deep into today's video, I wanted to talk to you about today's video sponsor, Factor. So I've been using Factor for quite a while now, and I'm absolutely in love with this. The reason is, it is a meal service that delivers fresh, quality, chef-prepared meals right to your door that are ready in two minutes. When I found out it was a thing, I was like, that is it. That is perfect for me because for me, time is the hardest thing to come by. And if I do find some time here or find some time over there, uh, where am I gonna put it? I'm gonna put it into building cars and going racing. That's just, a, that's just who I am. I like to eat healthy. I wanna eat healthy. I feel better when I'm eating healthy. I get more work done in the shop, but I just can't ever bring myself to sacrifice the time to go to the grocery store, create a checklist, figure out what to cook, look at recipes, make the food, clean the dishes. It, it's just, I just can't do it. I can't bring myself to do it. But with Factor, I get all the benefits while not having to spend any of the time. I mean, two minutes is just as fast as you can make literally anything. So I've been in love with it. I've been obsessed with it. It is great and it has really changed the way I eat and allowed me to eat healthy, cut takeout out of the, out of the mix entirely, which not only means I'm eating better, but I'm saving money on takeout. It's just all in all, win-win. And between Factor and HelloFresh, I mean, I'm completely covered. Fortunately, Factor is now owned by HelloFresh. So whichever one kind of fits your lifestyle, whichever one suits your needs, I can get you a discount code for either. So if you are interested in said discount code and trying it out, which I would highly recommend, head to factor75.com and use code TaylorDrifts50 to get 50% off your first box. That's factor75.com and code TaylorDrifts50 to get 50% off your first box. It's a great way to try it out and see what you think. If you're like me, you're gonna be sold instantly. Okay, I, I can tell you that much. So anyway, that being said, we need to get back to work. So. Let's get to it.
diff is installed. Subframe's back in. We're good to go. So Sway's gonna start working on putting the rear end back together, axles back in, arms back on, calipers, all that stuff. Pretty easy on this car, fortunately. I'm going to dive into upgrading our oil cooler. I've had the same oil cooler on this car since pretty much the very, very beginning. It's mounted like this because I also had a power steering cooler mounted here the same way because I had power steering before, which we don't have on this car anymore. So there's no real need to have it like this. So we're gonna upgrade to a Mishimoto bar and plate style oil cooler. These things are really, really nice. You can see TIG welded ends. This is a dual pass unit. So this should cool a lot better than the one we have. Now the oil doesn't get super hot, but once the oil gets up to temperature and kind of starts to get into that 220, 230 range, it takes longer for the car to cool down because the oil is heat soaked and it doesn't like to shed that temperature. So putting a bigger oil cooler on it should help it shed temperature quicker. Um, and then we can just keep the car running cool, which means we can do more laps without having to cool it down. You all right over there? Are you sure? <laughs> oh wow, I was always trying to fix the bushings. Our, our bushings on this car are shot everywhere. They're falling out, ripping apart, and the rears are no exception. So let's get to it. So fortunately, since the car has been sitting and hasn't been ran in a little while, there's not gonna be a ton of oil in these lines and in the cooler, most of it's gonna have drained back to the pan. So it's a relatively mess-free job pulling this oil cooler off. This thing has been in there forever and I'm honestly pretty excited to finally upgrade it. So I start working on placing the new cooler, figuring out where I want it to go. And me and Josue try to figure out which axles are which. When was the last time we put an axle in this car? Did we put one in? Was this the one we put in in the three minute call? Our five minute call where we did it in three? Cause like this grease is pretty black. So I'm wondering if this was an older axle that I built before I got the, the red, whatever grease, you know what I'm saying? It might've been that these shafts were more used. So I swapped the newer shafts in, which it was like mismatched, you know what I mean? Like I think maybe these two are newer shafts and those two are older shafts. It's been so long, I don't remember. No, it couldn't have been there in the five minute call because we broke both of those. Then I rebuilt them. So after spending some time in debating, trying to figure out which axle was which and which was the best one to use to replace the one that we broke, uh, well, Josue went ahead and got those cleaned up so that he could start working on installing them while he puts the rear end together. And I started test fitting the intake because I wanna get a good reference point of where to mount this oil cooler so it gets maximum airflow, but I also want this project to be as simple as possible. You know, I could definitely overcomplicate this and make this a big old project, but I, I really don't want to. I want this to be a simple, quick and dirty fab project. So I cut myself two pieces of steel and realized that they are way too wide. It was just a scrap piece that I had. So then I cut it in half and started grinding those to shape. I like to ground a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of corners into it just to make that little fit and finish nicer. It's not necessary but hey, it's rewarding and it's fun. So once I got them shaped, I cleaned them up with the Scotch-Brite disc and then got ready to test fit them in place, make sure they're the right size. And I wanna go ahead and mark my holes on these. Now, the reason is I wanna drill the holes first. That way I can bolt them to the oil cooler and then tack weld the oil cooler in place so that we know that all of our bolts lines up. That is a pet peeve of mine. I hate having to oblong holes and open bolt holes up. So I wanna make sure that everything's in place where it works and then we'll tack it on. So while I'm doing the exciting project of drilling some holes, so Sway's working on putting the rear end back together. Now, fortunately it is incredibly easy on this car and we've both done it a number of times. So it goes together pretty quick, you know, after working on the vet and working on the F80, it's definitely given me an appreciation for how easy it is to deal with the rear suspension on this car. I mean, even compared to something like an S chassis, this double A arm setup, everything's small, everything's light. It's, it's really easy to deal with and really easy to work with. So while he's doing that, I got my holes drilled. Now I need to clean off the paint and get ready to weld these brackets on. So I pulled over the MIG welder. I could have TIG this, but generally my rule of thumb with welding is anything on the car that I'm welding to, dirty steel that had paint on it or had rust on it or whatever, I'll MIG weld and anything that I'm doing 100% on the bench, I'll TIG weld. There's some exceptions where I'll MIG weld stuff on the bench and I'll TIG weld stuff on the car, but for the most part, that's how I like to do it. You know, I've got the MIG welder, I might as well use it. You're never gonna see these brackets. They're just a simple little 
piece of steel welded to a flat bar so no big deal there so we got them welded up and i like to throw some paint on them while they're still hot now that was a little bit too hot <laughs> probably should have waited a little longer but i like to do it while they're hot because the paint cures faster and i'm impatient and i want to get back to work so with a couple coats of spray paint on there now we just need to worry about the lines now fortunately i was able to mount it in a way where we're able to retain the one line all we've got to do is change the end on the second line now hopefully this will work and we can change just the end, not lengthen the line, not change the line, and get this to all go back together. That would be the easiest solution here. Fingers crossed. That was fast, dude. That was like a 45 minute, hour long oil cooler change. Oh, cool, we're done and dusted and crooked. <laughs> I forgot about that. I did this bar a long time ago and it was crooked and I just mounted these square with it. That's okay though. I ain't worried about it. That should be a big improvement though. It should really do a lot. Old tube and fin style, nothing wrong with these, but bar and plates are solid and it's dual pass. So with the oil cooler project done and dusted out of the way, we decided to move back on to finishing up the rear suspension. We've got to get the drive shaft in and drive shafts are always tricky to tighten and it's usually a bit of a two person project where you got to have one person holding it, one person tightening, you got to get them real tight. So I helped toast away with that and then we tossed the back section of the exhaust back on and the rear end is officially complete. It feels good. This car has been sitting with a broken rear end for months and months. If it it's, it's going to be nice to have this thing operational again. So with that out of the way, we just needed to toss the belt on to finish up the cooling system before we're ready to uh, put water in it and bleed it and see where we're at. All right, we're going to try to fill the cooling system and bleed it and see if we got any leaks. See if everything works like it should. So get some distilled water. If you're ever putting just water or mostly water in a cooling system, you want to use distilled water uh, because it has less junk in it. Now, the weird thing is Walmart used to sell you just distilled water in the water aisle, but they don't have it there anymore, at least at my Walmart. So <laughs> I have to take the baby's distilled water. It makes me feel bad. There, there may have been one time where there was like eight left and I took five, um, but I left three for the babies, even though I wanted all eight. <laughs> but you feel like you're stealing from the kids. Give me distilled water without making me feel guilty. I already put a gallon in that I had left over. I can never have enough of this stuff. I'll buy like eight gallons and then use six of them. And this thing's gonna be thirsty. It should be completely empty. Two and a half gallons down. So the neat thing here is since we have the electric water pump, we can bleed the system without ever running the engine. So I'll go ahead and unplug the fans because I have the button set up to turn the fans and the water pump on. Uh, so we should just run the water pump now. Right, I think that's about as blood as it's going to get. All right, now we need to change the oil, then we can fire it up, get it up to operating temp, make sure that it cools itself down correctly. This thing is not the easiest car to change the oil on, which is part of the reason why it doesn't get changed anywhere near as often as it should. This is like from a fridge, an old fridge, but it's like the perfect size to do this. So you gotta get this under the dry sump tank. To do that, you gotta unbolt the dry sump tank, then unhook the lines, and it's just a whole process. So that's why I hardly ever change the oil on this car, but she, She's handled it well. <laughs> so one of the reasons I dread doing this so much is it, it sounds simple to just unbolt the tank, but the problem is when you have these strap style mounts, they tuck in behind the tank. So the bolt is essentially behind it. And even with a wobble extension, you just can't really get a socket on there. You gotta sit there with a wrench. And when you're used to using power tools on everything, it feels like the slowest and most tedious process ever. But in reality, it's really not that bad in the grand scheme of things. It's just, it can be a little bit annoying, but we gotta do what we gotta do to keep this thing fresh and alive. So to pump the remaining oil out of the system, this is like a 2J, NA2J cam gear. And then we've got a spare dry sump belt and we use this to spin the dry sump pump and that'll pump oil through the system as if the engine was running. It's a little tricky because the belt likes to walk off if you're not dead on it. But... 
So admittedly, when the cars are running often, you know, we're doing a ton of events with it and we're changing the oil frequently. I don't do this step all the time because it's kind of a pain, but basically we're pumping all of the oil out. So that way we're draining the system entirely, draining the filter, all of the lines, the pan, everything. And that way we put fresh oil in the whole system. Normally I'll just drain and refill the tank it leaves a couple quarts in there, but it's not really the end of the world. But in this case, the car has been sitting a while and I'd like to get it all out and start fresh here. So the difficulty is trying to spin this pump is always a challenge. The belt wants to walk off. You can't really get on the nut on the pump because I may have broken a, a bolt off doing it that way. But we came up with a good solution. We were able to get the system primed with the fresh oil. We got to bolt the sway bar back on and we're ready to roll. What'd you say? <laughs> Nothing? You don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you look so majestic. All right, so we've got our systems filled. Cooling system is filled and bled. So that's done. Oil system is filled and bled. It should have almost all new oil. We got most of it out. It hasn't had an oil change in a long time. Like it's, it's, it's overdue. Oh, uh, no, that might not be true. I think maybe we did it before round three. I think we did. Never mind. Never mind. I'm being dramatic. What we want to do next before we dive into anything else is fire it up, bring it up to operating temperature, make sure we've got no coolant leaks, make sure we've got no oil leaks, make sure the oil is good, see what the oil temp does. Uh, just check everything over and then we can try to go drive it. We'll probably toss the passenger seat back in, pull all the nitrous stuff out, and then that way so he can ride with me on a short little drive. I don't think he's ever ridden in it on the street. We talked about this the other day, we're not sure. Maybe, maybe once. Maybe probably once. Not. It's pretty rowdy on the street, but we can't go very far, but then we got to put it back on the lift. What do you think? To do the seat. Should we just do the seat now? We do. Nitro's got to come out anyway. All right. You start taking the bottom bracket out. I'll start taking the solenoids out. Change of plans, people. <laughs> Scratch the cage, bro. Thing is mint. It's in. Wow, it's been a while since this thing's had two seats in it. Five point on. Boom. Boom. Click. Three. We got that thing tight, boy. Don't forget to loosen it up. <laughs> Boom. Solid. Say it. Say it. That ain't going nowhere. There you go. <laughs> I was gonna say it, but I can't say it for you. That's your line. All right, we got some uh, aluminum foil tape around the shroud. It's very important with a shroud that it is sealed to the radiator because if not, instead of pulling air through the core, it's just gonna pull it in through this crack here because there's less resistance. So always seal it. This has rubber seals, but just the way it's mounted, it's not perfectly sealed. So we went ahead, taped it all the way around. That's done, cooling system filled, oil seat in. So we shouldn't need to put the car back on the lift. So now we can take it off the lift, back it out of the shop, let it warm up, and uh, take it for a little spin. See what happens. Hopefully, uh, hopefully she's all good now.
right, well, so far it is cooling way faster than it ever has before. So we'll let it get up to 180. That's our fan on temp. So give us a minute and we'll see how fast it cools. The fans clicked on and then I went to go look at the temp, but by the time I walked it back over, it was at 170. So it was very quick. So it just probably just turned on. how fast it drops. Look at that. Look at that. Dang, dude. Hell yeah, look at that. That is fast. Especially with the car running. It's never been able to do that before. And there the fan should turn off. Yep. Sick. Definitely a worthwhile upgrade. Now I have heard that with these Mazir pumps, specifically this one, that like they get hot and they flow less with temperature at hotter temperatures, but I mean, well, you know, time will tell. It's just like this should flow like uh, 40 or 50 gallons a minute at idle. Oh, Whereas oh, this, this stock water pump would flow like, I think it's eight or nine, seven to nine at idle. So way less, way slower. And there's people that still think you need a thermostat to keep the water in the radiator long enough to cool down. That is the silliest theory ever. I, it, in my experience, has been proven to be completely untrue. All you need with the thermostat is to warm the car up, but it does not make the car cool better for it, but every time I've tried. If you want me to try to compression test it again after- Once it's hot, nah, I don't know what difference is it gonna make. If it's good, great. If it's bad, great. <laughs> we'll know. We'll hear it. The engine will stay in the car whether it's good or bad. <laughs> I'm excited to do a couple laps in it because I haven't done I, I haven't done a lap in this car since the vet's been done. Because it broke round three. That's right. Because there's no way you would have been able to drive it. Yeah, that'll be cool. Because I could do I could drive the vet and then like get straight in this and do a lap in this. <laughs> it's when when I was driving it all the time, like you would know it was rowdy, but you would really notice when you drove it on the street without a helmet on. Yeah. It's so much louder. You're like, holy cow, this thing's nuts. Dude, one day I should try to do some skids here. <laughs> right now, there's enough room. Like I've never really thought about it because I wanted to mark my driveway up, but I mean I could almost go down there, hard handbrake turn, come back and like make this wide. And then flip around there. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta do it in a quieter car though. <laughs> well, they're cool. I just, I would get annoyed if someone had a wild ass NASCAR sounding car. All of a sudden there's an earthquake. And doing pulls. All right, so while we got a little bit of time left in the evening, the Miata's ready to go. I mean, we, we could stand in alignment. We'll probably do that before we load it up. We still got like a week. What a week? About a week, a little over a week till the event. So we're ahead of schedule there. We're gonna fix this thing. Let's, uh, we're gonna get it on the lift and uh, I'll show you what, what we gotta do. I'm trying to sell this thing, but I can't sell it not 100%. So we need to make it 100%.
All right, so here's the deal. Basically, this car has kind of an odd engine transmission combination. It's a T56 Magnum transmission behind a Honda K24 with a quick time bell housing. And at the time that I put this car together, I couldn't find anyone who had done it. I couldn't find anyone making a clutch for it. I had to get a custom clutch made. And it's basically just a K-series clutch with T56 spines. The problem is the K-series clutch is really, really thin because it's normally in a front-wheel drive application with a front-wheel drive transmission. The result of that is the input shaft of the transmission doesn't engage the second disc. The disc close to the flywheel does, but like an eighth of an inch. And when I, the first time I drifted the car, it spun the spines, it tore up the spines. The car still drives, but it's, it's only using one disc. You know, one disc is the only thing taking all that load. So it's just gonna slip if you try to beat on it. So I reached out to Action Clutch, who I bought the clutch from, and they were able to come up with a solution, some parts I could buy that should hopefully fix our problem. So they came in while we were on Drift Week, so I'm gonna open these up and uh, see what we've got. So this will make more sense once we get the old stuff apart, but basically this is going to bolt to the flywheel and pressure plate's gonna bolt to this. It's gonna bring the pressure plate and the two discs and the floater and everything out 3 eighths of an inch which is what we need to get good full engagement. So basically this is just gonna go on the flywheel. This is gonna become our new flywheel, our new friction surface. So it's not the best solution, you know, obviously it would be better to just have a, a thicker or an offset flywheel, but it should get us in the game and do what we need to do. So I'll show you once we get the other disc out the problem, but this is also a replacement disc. So the other disc, the spines are torn like right here so if we just get this thing to go in three eighths of an inch, which is this, then it'll have full engagement. We probably could have gone more aggressive, but I didn't want to go too far. Uh, we are going to have to reshim the throw out bearing too. So anyway, I'm jibber jabbering. We're going to uh, get the trans yanked out of this thing so we can put this stuff in and hopefully have a fully working clutch. <laughs> So whenever I build cars, my number one goal is serviceability. I hate working on stuff that is difficult to work on. Things are hard to get to, everything's a nightmare. So this car is no exception, even though we did cram a T56, which is a pretty big transmission, in a relatively small trans tunnel, it's it's actually pretty easy to work on. The exhaust comes out one just one piece and you've got enough room to pull the transmission. We've got the lines right there that disconnect right by the transmission itself. And then we just gotta basically tilt it down and get the bolts out. Now, the only tricky thing is the engine doesn't tilt much because it's got pretty tight motor mounts. So it is a little tricky to get enough tilt to get the transmission out because it is a tight fit. But other than that, comes out super quick. I've also done this a couple times now since we put this car back together. So I'm pretty much a pro at this project. So we got that done. We got the transmission out. We got the clutch out and you can see what's wrong with the disc. Basically, it was just barely grabbing those spines. And as soon as it loaded up, it just stripped the spines because it was only holding on by just a, a hair, a, a millimeter. So this is basically the clutch package and, and what it's gonna look like when it goes in there. We're basically just spacing everything back off the flywheel, which will solve actually a couple of problems. So since we're spacing the clutch away from the engine towards the transmission, we need to adjust our throwout bearing distance. Now this kind of gets a little bit tricky because I have a spacer on here because everything was so far away, and with the spacer, I can't really get the throwout bearing far enough away if I adjust it all the way in. But without the spacer, I can't get it close enough if I adjust it all the way out. So I ended up going with all the way in. It's it's only like a millimeter shy. It should be fine, but I just, I really don't wanna pull this transmission back out. This is the third time I've had this thing out in the 50 miles this car has driven. So I'm trying to make sure it's all 100% this time. I knew when I put it back together last time that it would have to come back apart. So it's not that painful, but I'd like to avoid taking it apart again. So with the transmission ready to go, we just need to get the clutch fully installed and bolted up. What we like to do is basically tighten it down with the alignment tool and then pull the bolts out one by one, put Loctite on them, then put them back in and then torque everything down. Just that way you're not rushing, trying to get the Loctite on there and, and get them all in in time and then snug it up. It just, it's a little bit easier to do it that way. So with the clutch in and aligned, all you gotta do is put the transmission in. Now it is a little bit challenging just because once you pull the transmission off, the engine doesn't have as much reason to tilt. So unless you wanna jack the front of the engine up, you're kind of fighting the engine not being tilted enough. And in this transmission tunnel, it is really tight. You do not have a lot of 
room to move this thing around and get it in place. So it's a bit of a fight, but we've done it enough times now. We've, we've got the process pretty down pat. So we get the bell housing bolts in, we get the transmission mount bolted back up, Postway's got the lines hooked up, and then we just need to install the drive shaft and get those bolts tightened down, which probably takes about half as much time as the entire rest of the process. Tightening drive shaft bolts is always so tedious. They're always tough to get to and trying to hold everything still, but I, I, I let Josue handle that. He's good at it. So we get that done, and then we've just got to put the exhaust in, hook the wide band back up. We can drop this thing down. Josue is going to work on putting the shifter back in, and I'm going to work on getting set up to bleed the clutch. Now, fortunately, on this car, we have a remote clutch bleeder line. So all we've got to do is loosen the bleeder, put it in the reservoir, and then bleed it back to itself. Piece of cake. You guys aren't gonna be able to see anything. I just wanna see where we're at with this thing, see if it's good. Gotta work on tuning up the idle. I had it dialed. It's the thing with standalone cars, man. You'll have certain stuff dialed and then it'll just not work good after that. Like ran right at, at random. The clutch itself feels way better, which I wasn't expecting. Like it actually feels like it should. The clutch is way easier to slip in. At least the clutch is fixed. Now I'm gonna fix an exhaust leak. All right, Spiro's back in the shop. We've still got a little tinkering to do. We've got an exhaust leak, which is throwing the wide band off, which is throwing the self flaring off, which is throwing the tune off. It's a bit of a, a bit of a domino effect. It's one of those things. Fix one problem, find another. But I'm really happy that the clutch is sorted. You know, that was one thing I couldn't get rid of the car with a half working clutch and it feels way better than it ever has because now it's it's properly spaced and everything's engaging correctly. So that all feels good. Rattles and vibrations are still kind of there. It's just part of it with the K-Series. To get rid of those, we'd have to swap the subframe. I have solid subframe bushings because I didn't even think about it. I didn't know how bad the resonance was gonna be and that makes a big difference with this engine. So, you know, maybe something we'll look into before we get rid of her, but I'm just happy to have it back up and running and functional again. I'll have to tinker with the tune, tinker with the exhaust leak, but that's done and dusted. Miata, ready to roll, as far as I can tell. I mean, again, we'll probably throw an alignment on it before we take it to the track, just to make sure it's good for these guys, but I think it's ready. So next up, I guess, is the vet. Get the vet ready, since I'm gonna drive that. Go test it out. I should have the other F80 back here soon as well, so I can go through that thing and fix all the little things and make all the little changes I wanted to make. And we're collecting parts for this thing, so. Plenty of stuff in the works, plenty of stuff to do, but I just wanted, my goal right now is to get all of my vehicles running and driving correctly and sell a few vehicles. So trying to get that knocked out before we get knees deep in something else. And then I don't have time. I do that to myself a lot where I'm super deep in a project and I'm like, I don't have time to do all this shop projects and all this other stuff. I gotta get this car done. But then when it's done, I'm like, what am I gonna do with myself? I like being in a project. It is what it is. So anyway, I'm rambling. So. I'm gonna end it here, but thank you guys for watching. Thanks for subscribing. I hope to see you next time.